God, all the glory, people. That is awesome. Father God, we come before you, if you would, just, uh, just bow your heads in prayer with me. Father God, we come before you today. We thank you for this opportunity to worship in freedom and in truth. And Lord, we just know that you are on the throne. And that this week, this, this start of Holy Week, Father God, the last seven days of, of what was your earthly life, Lord, we just give you glory for that. Knowing the outcome and what is in store for us in just seven days. Lord, I ask you to be with those that need you today as Jehovah Rapha. Those that need your healing touch today, Father God. I ask that you be with them and protect them and guide them in all that they do. Lord, I ask you, again, to be with our military and our police and our firefighters and just continue to watch over them in keeping us free and serving our country, Father God. Let them know that you are present with them in all that they do. Lord, I lift up those that are here today. Let their ears be open, their hearts be receptive, and their minds be understanding of the words that you have chosen to be shared today, Father. And be with us always, Lord, as you guide us and you teach us and we understand what this relationship is with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Watch your eyes as Karen turns on the light. The kids are going to make their way out. Greet somebody. Tell them hi as Rebecca makes her way up here. Good morning.
If you don't have our new app yet, please go to your app store, whatever you have, whether it's an Apple or Android device. It's available on Roku, Google, all sorts of Amazon, everything. So go ahead and download it if you need help. I'm really not much of a help other than Apple devices. So beyond that, go to dad, maybe he can help you out, but not me. But download it because it's great, it's revamped, and it looks really nice. If you do not follow us on social media yet, there's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel for all of the sermons. You are sent updates, important information, and we would love for you to follow us on all platforms or whatever you have. If you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, you can hover over the icon or the, the QR code, and it will take you directly to that link so that you can subscribe. Uh, men, you lucky ducks get to start a men's group starting Friday, April 7th. Dad has it here as Elsinboro, but he said they don't open until 7 o'clock exactly. So we are actually changing that location. It will be held at Rio Ranch um, out towards Ingram. So they are, they are open a little earlier than that and will be prepared for groups of our size. Uh, but men's group starting every Friday morning at 7 a.m. at Rio Ranch. <coughs> uh, next week is Easter Sunday. We would love for y'all to join us as our family and our friends, as our church group. Come early, enjoy our normal coffee and donuts and all the love that we have to offer. But today is Palm Sunday, so I'm going to hand it back to Dad, and I want you to enjoy the message. Thank you, Beck. Give her a hand, everybody. She just... Uh... For being a teacher, I make her work an extra day of the week. She's so used to talking to kids all day. Just so you know, uh, something else I added on the app this morning, for those of you, instead of picking up a prayer list, if you have the app, the prayer list is now on the app. So it saves you from having to go around with a little piece of paper. It is, uh, it's actually a hidden page on the website, but you have a direct link. It can go through the app. It's under the Connect tab. You will see prayer lists. Have at it. Uh, the more you guys send me prayer requests, the more names I can add to the list, but also when a prayer gets answered, because God still answers prayers, right, church? Yeah. Let us know so we can remove the name off the list. That'd be a great thing to start. So today we're so thankful that you are here. We hope you know how much we love you, right? You can tell that, can't you? Yes. Really? Like yes. part of you said that. Yes. We do love you guys. We love you so much. That is that is what God has put on our hearts is to show you what love truly is. And that's what we do here at Transformation Church. Those of you watching online, the same goes for you. Come see us sometime. We'd love to have you join us in person. So today, today is Palm Sunday. It marks the beginning of what is known as Holy Week, the final week of the human life of Jesus that he had here on earth. Palm Sunday is a day in which we commemorate Jesus' courageous entrance into Jerusalem. It kicks off this week when he was arrested Convicted, crucified, and most importantly, resurrected. From the worldly viewpoint, Jesus is about to have a week of nothing but failures. By these failures, those sufferings, they contrast God's nature of love with mankind's nature to control and dominate. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He washed his disciples' feet. A close friend betrayed him. Has that ever happened to one of you? It has, but his got him killed. Remember that. He's been spit on, abandoned, beaten, whipped, tried, and convicted of being the king of the Jews, which is exactly what he was and what he still is today. And finally, he was crucified. He died, was buried. And these events all contrast God's holiness with humanity's sinfulness. When something is put under force and trauma, we find out what it's made of, right? Take a lemon. If you took the lemon and you squeeze the lemon, what are you going to get? Lemon juice. If you had an orange and you squeeze the orange, what are you going to get? Orange juice. I think Dave even said orange juice for the lemon, but that's okay. <laughs> so what happens what happens when we take the Lord Jesus, who is the Son of God, and he rides into town on a donkey, and again, he washed the feet of his disciples, 
He gets convicted, crucified, dies, buried. And what do you get when that happens? You get a crystal clear picture of God's core nature of self-giving love. That's what you get. Jesus endured the events of the cross in order to save humanity. The, there was no other alternative going on. God knew this plan from the beginning, and in doing so, he demonstrated that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, who came into the world to save the world, not to condemn it, church. And today we're going to focus, we're going to focus on his courageous entrance into Jerusalem. So let's start off by reading the story out of Matthew. We're going to look at Matthew 21. 1 through 11. The word says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. <clears throat> when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So, the story begins with Jesus approaching Jerusalem before the events. He sent two of his disciples to get a donkey and a colt out of the village. The disciples do what they were told. They return with both the donkey and the colt. And then the text says this was done to fulfill the prophecy from Zechariah, who envisioned that the Messiah would truly enter Jerusalem lowly, and in this version said, gentle, and riding on a donkey. So today, this Palm Sunday, I want to share three things with you about Jesus and this day. Are you ready? Okay, let's dive in. First, Jesus has all authority. Everything. Nothing can happen without his authority. But there's a couple things going on with this. First, when he came in riding on this donkey, this shows authority. Let me tell you how. Riding into Jerusalem on a donkey is a highly intentional move by Jesus. In the ancient world, if a king rode into town on a horse, he, he intended war and aggression. But if he rode into town on a donkey, he came in peace. He intended for peace. Jesus rode into town on a donkey to demonstrate that his kingship will be one of peace. <clears throat> the passage from Zechariah in 9 and 10 says, I will take the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. God knew what he was doing. This is the, mess the messianic prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling here. He is the anointed one, the Messiah, the king coming to town to proclaim peace instead of conflict. The war's over. We win. There's no more violence. But I don't think the disciples or the crowds fully understood what Jesus was doing right before their eyes. 
In fact, the Gospel of John says in John 12 and 16, at first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only that Jesus was glor only when after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had to be done to him. But church, throughout the Gospels, there's something that's not being talked about. And it took some research to find this. We call this Jesus' triumphant entry, right? You've heard that term before? On this day, there were two triumphant entries into Jerusalem. It was the start of Passover week. Jesus just showed us his entry and the peace that he was bringing. But being the start of Passover week and Rome still being the ruling authority in Jerusalem, in order to show that they were still in charge, they would have had a parade on the other side of town themselves. A triumphal entry themselves with Pilate in the lead. The Roman government would display an overwhelming show of force during the Passover season. As the Jewish pilgrims would all make their way back towards the city, they would be greeted by an all-inspiring show of Roman military might. Pilate would triumphantly ride into the city on Rome's renowned cavalry, which is on a horse, followed by thousands of heavenly armed foot soldiers. The people would watch these soldiers wearing their leather armor, their helmets, and carrying swords, spears, and shields as they made their way into the city. And high above their heads on banners would be flying the Roman golden eagles mounted on poles. They would, they would hear the thunderous march of the feet the creaking of the leather and the clinking of the horse's bridles. They would hear the deafening sound of the drums and they would struggle to breathe as the swell of dirt being caused by the soldiers filled the air. It was an exaggerated display of superior military might and power. And it was said, and it was used to send both a warning and a message. It's imperative for us to understand that Jesus is riding into Jerusalem at the time that he did and in the manner that he did was not by accident. Jesus knew what he was doing. This was not a late minute decision. Jesus had planned this ride into Jerusalem for some time. He knew what was going on on the other side of town. He knew because for the last 33 years of his life, it happened each and every Passover. Rome's army, led by its appointed governor, would be riding into Jerusalem with his army on the back of a horse, and he knew that Rome would be sending this message of imperialism and military might. He knew that Rome would be sending the message of no tolerance. Jesus knew that it would look, or what it would look like, to have a counter parade coming from the other direction. He knew how it would be viewed by the Romans, the Jewish authorities, and the Sanhedrin. He knew that they would not be welcoming him or his followers. He knew that he had already given their soul, that they had already given their sole allegiance to Rome, and that they would be hostile to both his claim and his message. Jesus knew what his little parade would be saying. He knew the hostility. That he would be facing. He knew the danger of it all. But as we read in our passage, all of this was all planned. He had the colt and its mother waiting. Jesus knew what he was doing, and he was unafraid of Rome or the Sanhedrin. They didn't scare him. The second way we see Jesus as having authority is Jesus proclaims himself king. Jesus is proclaiming himself to be king, and this is no small thing. Again, in Matthew 21, 11, the crowds declared Jesus to be the prophet from Nazareth. But that's not what Jesus claimed for himself. He was more, of, he was more than a moral teacher and more than a prophet. He was and is the king and the messiah. 
When Jesus rode that donkey into the city of Jerusalem, he was inviting Israel to accept him as the Messiah. He was inviting the nation of Israel to accept him as the one who God had sent to be the anointed one. He was inviting Israel to welcome his plan for salvation. But this was not the first time that Jesus proclaimed his Messiahship. If you take time to look at all the signs and wonders and miracles that Jesus did, his exorcisms, his teachings, his revelations, then you'll be, you'll be able to see over and over and over again just how many times Jesus revealed to the people his identity, his kingship, his lordship. During his life and ministry, Jesus consistently demonstrated true authority. Jesus had and still has all authority over nature, demons, sickness, and death. Jesus spoke with authority. For example, in Mark 1, 40 and 42, we read the story of Jesus healing the leper. Everyone familiar with that story? The word says, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was clean. See, what's vital for us to see here is, is the story is Jesus' words to the leper. When the leper asked Jesus to heal him, both his words and Jesus' words are very important. The leper has faith that Jesus is the Messiah. He's watched what he's done. He trusts in him. And you can see that by the way he asked Jesus to do this. He was talking to the almighty God. Yahweh himself. Jesus responds, not by saying, my father or the God of Israel heals you. These are Jesus' words. I am willing. Be clean. Those are not words of an ordinary human being. Prophets didn't say those words. Only God can heal and only God can create new flesh and tissue. Jesus was revealing himself to this leper, to his disciples, and to all who would read these words. That's you and me. Now in this passage, Jesus is displaying once and for all that he is the coming Messiah. He is the true king of Israel. He is the anointed one. He is the one that they have been waiting for since the time of the great fall. And scripture is full of stories just like this, where Jesus is claiming his kingship and his authority. Mark 1.22 says, The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Mark 4.39, he protected people from storms and waves by rebuking them. In John 9.7, he healed them from blindness. He helped lepers, like in the story we just read. And in Mark 131, he healed fevers. He set people free from evil spirits, we find in Matthew 8.32, and demons in Luke 4.41, and so many more, folks. There's tons of examples of Jesus doing just this. But at Jesus' word in Matthew 4.10, the devil left him. So Jesus has authority over Satan. Demons leave, fevers disappear, paralysis goes away because he has authority over them all. Nature had to obey him because nature is under his authority. Do you see that? The devil and his demons have to obey him because they are also under his authority. It's not mine or yours that they're afraid of. It's his. And if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what, church? 
You have his authority. <clears throat> the same goes with sickness and disease. They are all under his authority. And just as God spoke the cosmos into existence, in Genesis, everything under Jesus' authority must comply with whatever he speaks because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, the early Christians understood that. Their creed was Jesus is Lord. We see that in Scripture. The word Lord meant absolute authority. It was not a fancy way to say Mr. They didn't go around calling him Mr. Jesus. They didn't do it. They confessed him, Jesus is Lord. He has complete authority over everything in this world. Nature, sickness, demons, death, and them, as well as us, if we allow him. This proclamation got them killed, by the way. Because at that time, only Caesar was Lord. The Christian's proclamation was punishable as treason. Now, while Jesus was brutal against severe weather, demons, and sickness, he was also loving, welcoming, and direct with people. This is the Jesus who ate with tax collectors, who sat with sinners, and let sinful women wet his feet with their tears. Jesus touched the untouchable. He loved those who were oppressed. And he also loved the oppressor. Why? Why did Jesus do this? Because we read in John 3.17 through 18. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Jesus used his authority to save, to heal, and to make people whole. And that authority is the same today. He never used it for selfish purposes or for gratuitous displays of power. Jesus used it humbly in a way to demonstrate God's self-giving love that were consistent with his mission. By sitting on a donkey, Jesus was using maybe a little bit of theater to get across his powerful message. That message was that Jesus was proclaiming his identity as Israel's Messiah. Jesus was telling the world that he was the one who Israel had been looking for, the anointed one. But here's the question, though. Jesus has all authority, like we've said, over nature, sickness, demons, and death. But does he have all authority over you? Are you truly his disciple? I don't mean if you accepted some creed about him, but do you trust him? Do you trust him as Lord of your life? Church, I chose to accept Christ when I was 18 years old. I didn't know what the relationship was until I was 30. Twelve years, I was a floundering Christian. At a Promise Keepers event in Denver, Colorado, I came to know this Jesus as the total Lord of my life, this loving Father, this friend that I could talk to whenever I needed to. That was the day that I gave everything to him. Now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I mess up. I make mistakes. I take things back that I have given to him. Church, your pastor's human. 
But even in my mistakes, even in my mess ups, even in my take backs, Jesus is still Lord over my life. He took all of my sins, past, present, and the stupidity of tomorrow, or even 20 minutes from now. And he's forgiven me for all of those. He's made me clean. Because I trusted him. This man who proclaimed his kingship on the back of a donkey. The second thing today is Jesus is courageous. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem had been planned, and it wasn't a whim. I said that a minute ago, but before Jesus rode into town, he needed a donkey. So he sent his disciples to fetch the one that he already had in mind. He gave them instructions and said if anyone questioned why they wanted the donkey, they simply said, the Lord needs them. Mark tells us that the village was Bethany. That's where they were prior to this. That's where Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Bethany knew him as Lord. So it made common sense that if someone stopped him and they said, the Lord needs it, they know they were talking about Jesus. It was established well in advance. Jesus had been planning this entrance for a while. And again, the timing was perfect. Jesus knew Jerusalem would be crowded with pilgrims for Passover. See, the, the Jewish law back then, the custom, was that all Jewish males who lived within 20 miles of Jerusalem were required to come into the city for Passover. There were people in the city that did not know who Jesus was. And not only did they come, but Jews from all over the world, that part of the world, travel for this Passover festival. Jerusalem would have been jam-packed with tens and of thousands of expected visitors focused on the Passover. This was the time for Jesus to make a statement for everyone to see. See, the, the Jewish leaders, if you know scripture, they were already planning to kill Jesus. The most dangerous thing that Jesus could do was Enter the city in broad daylight with pomp and circumstance. Surely they would have seen him coming. But that's exactly what he did. Jesus courageously made himself the sacrificial lamb entering the city. He knew those who hated him and wanted him dead would be triggered by his actions and his decisions. They were based on doing God's will rather than how men in power <coughs> would react. He didn't care. Jesus was courageous, and he calls us to be courageous as well. So do you think there's a lack of courage in your life? Real quick, on a, on a scale of 1 to 10, let me know how courageous you think you are, but you can't say 7, because everybody says 7. Got a 5. Throw some numbers out. <laughs> 4.93. Do we have a mathematician in the house? I like that. Let's be specific here for a second. Because if you are courageous, you will do the right thing regardless of the consequences. If you are courageous, you will feel fear, but you'll do it anyway. If you're courageous, you will not stop at failure, and you will risk being criticized. And if you are courageous, you will pursue purpose over comfort. I think Jesus was being courageous in each of those ways. To be courageous is to be Christ-like, church. Are you Christ-like? If I were to ask you on a scale of 1 to 10, are you Christ-like, would you have answered differently? Probably. Too many of us are stopped by fear. We avoid failure and criticism, and we are stuck in comfortable lives with little meaning or purpose. Church, helping you get unstuck is something that we at Transformation want to do. 
We want to help you find what it is you were designed for, what it is you do, what it is that makes you tick. What are your spiritual gifts? Once you know what your gifts are, once you find out what you were called to do, what your purpose is, your purpose in the body. Remember, we are a body of Christ. For those that you know that don't go to church, that very well could be our hand that we're missing. What is your purpose? What part do you play? Something we do here is spiritual gifting. We want people to know what they're designed for. If you haven't taken it yet, let us know. We'll get it to you. We want you to know what you were designed to do. Because once you know, you'll be amazed at what your true passions are. And we love you. And we want you to live the way you were designed. The third thing, who do you say Jesus is? In Matthew 21, 8, we read that as Jesus entered the city, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. This was a reception that normally was only reserved for kings. They knew he was a king but they didn't know of what. Jesus, however, had no intention of taking political power like most kings do. He was only interested in becoming the king of their hearts. Each and every person that he came in contact with, his kingdom was not and still is not of this world. They shouted, Hosanna, which means save now. And it comes from Psalm 118.25. Save now. That's exactly what Jesus came to do. Remember in John 3.17, he said he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And they asked again in Matthew 21.10, who is this? <coughs> There were people there that did not know who Jesus was. Tens of thousands of visitors in the city for Passover. And they had yet to be exposed to Jesus. This is why so many are asking, who is this? Then in Matthew 21, 11, we see the response. The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The crowd called him a prophet. Because church, they did not fully understand who he was. But those closest to Jesus, those who spent time with him, listened to him, engaged with him, and, le and learned to obey him, they knew exactly who he was. He was not a prophet or just a great moral teacher. He was more than that. He was not an earthly king. He was beyond an earthly king. Those who knew him called him the Messiah, the Son of God, who came into the world to save it, not to condemn it. Jesus brought salvation. And when these disciples prayed for salvation, they should have understood from everything Jesus taught how he healed and cast out demons. That he would not be fighting the kind, but he would be defeating the devil, evil, hell, and the grave. They should have understood that according to 1 John 3, 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. This is why Jesus rode a donkey of humility and love. This is why he was whipped, cursed, and put on the cross for all mankind's sins. Jesus was not interested in destroying mankind. He was not even interested in destroying the Roman government. 
He came to rescue and redeem mankind. He came to restore mankind into the image of God. And today, Palm Sunday, it's the first day of the Passion Week. It begins today and ends Sunday next week with Resurrection Sunday. For the world, they call it Easter. But it's not about the bunny. It's about the cross. Sometimes we focus so much on Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday individually that we tend to lose sight of what happened in between. The Monday through the Sunday. Because what happened, church, was significant. What happened was monumental. What happened was Jesus. Jesus answered those disciples' call for salvation, for Hosanna. Jesus fought the battle to become earth's true king. To take back the keys of the kingdom and enable men, women, boys, and girls to once again have a personal relationship with God. Free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. Jesus' battle was far larger than one against human enemies. Jesus' battle was a supernatural battle against the powers of all evil, destruction, and death. If Jesus had wanted to... He could have raised a human army and put Rome to pasture. He could have started the week off when there were 250,000 plus different people in Jerusalem. He could have overtaken the 20 to 30,000 member Roman legion that was stationed there. When Jesus was asked by Pilate, Jesus even told him that if he wanted he could call down 12 legions of angels. But we don't know exactly what that number is. It's estimated between 50 and 144,000 angels. So given that, we saw in 2 Kings 19 and 35 that one angel took care of 185,000 soldiers. Just one. Jesus was saying... I can call on enough angels to destroy billions and billions and billions of people. In other words, I can, at my command, call on enough angels to obliterate the earth. But church, that's not why he came. He wanted Pilate to understand that this battle was not against humankind. It was a battle far bigger and far with far more implications. It was a battle for the soul of mankind and the soul of all creation. Jesus knew that the only way to get rid of evil kingdoms like the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and even the Romans was to destroy them. But he came to transform people's hearts instead. He wanted to infiltrate those kingdoms with him. Israel was supposed to build an everlasting kingdom in the promised land. It would be ruled by God's people living according to God's ways. It would be a land that would be a light to all the nations of the world. It would be a land that would bring peace, joy, and prosperity to all nations of the world. That's why God called his people out of Egypt. It wasn't to destroy the earth. But to plant his people. Accomplishing his mission. And sharing his message with the rest of the world. It was to be a way for God to transform the earth. But we all know that that's not what happened, is it? Those ancient Israelites committed the very sin that Adam and Eve and all of mankind since has done. They chose sin and rebellion over obedience and commitment. Mankind very much needed to be rescued and redeemed. Mankind very much needed more than a new government. 
Sound familiar? Mankind needed a total recreation, or I'm sorry, recreation. It needed a recreation of the heart, of the mind, and of the soul. Sin had ruined the very core of humanity. And so we see Jesus coming in to battle Satan on a donkey. A battle that he would win on a cross. Jesus would fight a battle that would result in his resurrection and the outpouring of his Holy Spirit upon the earth. Jesus would fight a battle in which he would pay the penalty for all sin. And he would break the power of sin over all mankind. That's all of us, church. So again, I ask, who do you say that Jesus is? In John eleven twenty seven, 27, Martha said, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. In Matthew 16, 16, Peter, his disciple, he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And when Jesus revealed himself to the Samaritan woman at the well, she went back and she told the town everything. Everything that he said to her was true. The town invited Jesus and his disciples to stay two days with them. And after that stay, we read in John 4, 42, that the town said, we no longer believe just because of what you said, speaking to the woman. We now have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man, this man, really is the Savior of the world. So church, I ask you again, who do you say Jesus is? Is he a prophet? Is he a moral teacher? Or is he your Lord, your absolute authority? C.S. Lewis said this, let us not say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So church, who is he? Is he just a prophet? A madman? Or a lunatic? Or is he Lord? Is he God? Is he the Messiah? the anointed one, the savior of the world. Did Jesus ride into Jerusalem on a donkey as just the courageous king? Or did Jesus ride into Jerusalem on a donkey as your courageous king? Amen. Goodbye, your heads. Father, your word rings true. It always has, and it always will. Man can pervert it. Man can change what it says to their liking. But it doesn't change the truth. And the truth is we are sinners who need a Savior, and you are the only one, Jesus, that can do that for us. You came into the world to save us not condemn us. 
You came into the world to teach us truth, to teach us love, compassion, mercy, and grace. You came into the world to be the sacrificial lamb, the last lamb that would ever be needed. As we celebrate your triumphant entry into Jerusalem today, knowing that you came in peace, let us be mindful of who you really are. With all eyes closed and heads bowed, if there's anyone here today that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and you're ready to make that decision, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you down. Just raise your hand where you're at. Let me know. For the rest of us, as we, as we embrace on this week, with, with your eyes closed still, let's prepare our hearts and our minds for communion. And, and if anyone does not have elements, just raise your hand real quick. Karen will get them to you uh, in just a minute. But no, everyone's got them. Good. So as we prepare our hearts, if you would, just, just repeat these words after me. Father God, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I thank you for being who you are to me, Lord of my life, my courageous King, my Lamb. You died for my sins so that I can be forgiven and live with you for all of eternity. I thank you for that, Lord. Let your light forever shine through my actions, my words, and my deeds. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you'll take out your communion, we want you to have some. Again, if you don't, just raise your hand. Karen will get it to you. As you do this, go ahead and take out the wafer and just look at it for a minute. Know what this is. This is the bread of life, church. This is the week that the words I'm about to share, this is the week they came from. Jesus' final Passover meal with his disciples. He broke bread and he gave it to them and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which has been broken for you. And he told them, each time you take of this, remember me. Jesus then took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he said, take, drink. This is the blood of the new covenant, which has been shed for the forgiveness of sins. Man did not talk that way. Only God. Only God. And he knew that his blood would be shed as that sacrificial lamb. And he told them that at every time you drink of this cup, remember me. If you'll pray with me again. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us enough to look past our mistakes, our wrongs, and providing a way to live with you in eternity. Lord, this week is important to the Christian faith. This week, this week you proved yourself to the world who you were. Let us all be bold and courageous this week. Let us all share what Resurrection Sunday is really about. Let us be bold. Let us invite someone. Lord, you are a mighty God. And you have freed us from sin and death because you loved us that much. I speak protection over everyone here today and those watching online. 
Bring them safely back to us next week, Father. And as we gather in your name, let us remember the body is this. It's in your name I give all glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Go into the world, folks. Loving God, loving people, and living your design. See you next week.